We're really excited to have this amazing collection of artists here showing their beautiful, beautiful creations. Um, not all of them will be speaking, but we will have a few up here um, doing presentations and en engaging in a conversation. And after they do, we'll also be taking questions from the audience. I'm Thea Austin. I'm the Public Events Coordinator for the American Folklife Center. And um, welcome to the, the uh, American Folklife Center's Benjamin A. Botkin Lecture Series. The Botkin Series allows us to highlight the work of leading scholars in the disciplines of folklore, ethnomusicology, oral history, and cultural heritage, while enhancing collections here at the American Folklife Center. For the center and the library, the Bodkin lectures form an important facet of our acquisitions activities. Each presentation is videotaped and becomes part of the permanent collections of the center. In addition, the Bodkin presentations are later posted as webcasts on the library website, where they're available for viewing to internet patrons around the world. It's fantastic. So if you haven't already done so, please turn off your cell phones. Um, so we don't catalog your cell phone rings for all eternity. And um, today, oh, let's see, we don't have everybody in their seats. Um, Cynthia. <laughs> yes, Cynthia. <laughs> Can we have Cynthia? And Kabibi? Um, and who? Don't sit anywhere. And Paula. <laughs> Paula, you're all so modest. <laughs> no, no. I told you. <laughs> okay. Okay, now we have everybody up here. Um, but I'm going to start by introducing um, folklorist Camila Bryce Laporte, who um, used to be an American Folklife Center folklife specialist here at the Library of Congress and is now an independent folklorist based in Baltimore. Really? Well, Silver Spring, Baltimore. <laughs> Camila received her BA. <laughs> Um, yes, well, this is Kabibi, who is based in Baltimore, and, <laughs> and they work together a lot. Um, Camila received her BA from Sarah Lawrence College of Fine Arts in Performing Arts and Humanities. Um, sorry, she received her BA from Sarah Lawrence College in Fine Arts, Performing Arts, and the Humanities, and then worked in folklore studies at George Washington University for more than 30 years. This multi-talented scholar has worked on children's programming and cultural and educational programming for children's television, uh, the Chil Children's Television Network, CBS Cable, the Smithsonian Institution, and of course, the Library of Congress. We have her to thank for doing the foundational work with these amazing artists who are here today and for organizing this wonderful event. So please join me in welcoming her. So you met my friends and <laughs> uh, before I got started, hi Lizetta. There are a lot of doll artists in here. Tanya and Ingrid came probably the furthest, my good friend and mentor and sister, Diane and Jai, and so many others here. I want to thank you all for coming out. And um, let me just see if I can do this. Uh, when I left here, hi, Jennifer. <laughs> when I left here, I guess it was almost 25 years ago, uh, we were working on a project. Alan Jabor asked me to work on a project on African American sacred music. And if you remember Horace Boyer, he was an ethnomusicologist. Do you remember him? Yep. He once told, he said, African American sacred music that we know is probably not the music that ushered African Americans through slavery. It was something deeper. And as a firstborn girl, a firstborn girl, if you're from the Caribbean, you know what that means. 
family and community comes first and your spirituality comes right there with it. You're always in touch with your ancestors. You're always in touch with your past. So as I immersed myself in the slave narratives, because I knew the secrets to who we were were there, I realized that I was speaking, I was listening not to anonymous voices, but to the voices of our ancestors. I couldn't separate from them. I realized that some of the struggles that I had and continued to have and the fights that I was having, they were having too. But they had no way out. They had no way to defend themselves, so I thought. And I began doing the research and found out that women were through their crafts and through the way of their lifestyle were also in the movement of resistance. And one of the big ways was through crafts and through um, what we call, you know, women's art, okay? In their hair, there were messages of survival, right? In their dolls, there were memories of the past. It was a lot for me to handle. I didn't understand it at the time. And then I met this community of doll artists, and it all began to make sense. I'm going to read a little bit and then you know, talk to you. The community of African-American artisans utilize ancient skills and innovative technologies to create dolls and puppets that are both whimsical and starkly serious. Their creations incorporating clay, textiles, wood, glass, and found objects embrace some of the somber reality of African American of the African American experiences, the optimism for and the optimism for a boundless future. Working alone or in groups, these artisans create dolls and puppets that articulate black beauty strength, style, spirituality, and truth. Their work embodying older traditions and innovative vocabularies for storytelling are designed to amuse, educate, and heal. Following in the African traditions, African American dolls and puppets are more than decorative playthings. They are the living expressions of the artist's values, traditions, and beliefs. Some incorporate African motifs of beauty, sensuality, and spiritualities. Others, dressed in dress and proportion, reflect creolization, blended African, European, and Native American cultures, values, and traditions. Some contemporary dolls marry the characteristics of androgynous slave cloth dolls styles. Still others don sassy styles of contemporary designers. Tanya. Black doll artists helm a movement to reverse the continued impact of colonization. Their aim is to transfer, transform the perception of black people and their bodies. To accomplish this, black artists, uh, the black doll artists physically and contextually defy conventional limitations. For them, there are no rules. Their dolls celebrate black people's gifts and their accomplishments. And in the capable hands of doll artists, even painful stereotypes like mammies, babies, pickaninnies that reflected the paternalistic relationship between blacks and whites are recast to show the strength and resilience of a people. For these African-American artisans, doll making is a spiritual, educational, provocatively empowering and healing art form. Doll making and puppetry help them to discover and reclaim self. <clears throat> Lewis Smith, founder of Shinoda Toys, put it this way, we believe only by learning to love oneself can one lean, can one learn to love others. So now we're gonna have an interactive form, meaning they're going to speak and you can ask questions probably at the end. Um, my dolls, I'm going to speak, I'm going to introduce my dolls, and then I'm going to introduce uh, Deborah uh, Grayson is going to take over because I have asthma, and I'm going to start to cough, and I want you to hear what's, what has to be said. Uh, the dolls that I have 
are born of slavery. They, they range from the 16th century. They, they're based on real characters that, that existed between the 16th century and the 19th century. And these are females, primarily from the Caribbean, who were part of the resistance movement. Um, and why did they need resistance? What were they resisting? Uh, Linda, um, Deborah's going to introduce Linda Cato, and she's going to she's going to come up and explain what the resistance was about and how deep it was, what the slavery was about from her perspective, and how deep it was. Okay, thank you very much. When your sister friends ask you to help, you help. Yeah. <laughs> but just bear with me because I am really doing this on the fly. <laughs> okay. So I'm Deborah Grayson, and I'm really honored and privileged to introduce the artists here. And there are several artists in um, the audience as well, whom I hope will um, introduce themselves as we move forward. Um, I'm an independent scholar myself and an artist. I brought some of my piece boxes back there. And I can talk a little bit more about that, but I really want to introduce the folks here. So first is Kabibi Ajanku, who curates and guides the elements of the Urban Arts Leadership Fellowship for the Greater Baltimore Cultural Alliance, where she serves as Equity and Inclusion Director. Ajanku is also the Urban Arts Professor for a small cohort of students at Coppin State University, and additionally serves as Community Researcher for Maryland Institute College of Art. Let's see. Dr. Schroeder Cherry here is a native Washingtonian, is now a Baltimore-based artist and 2019 Sondheim competition finalist who captures everyday scenes of African-American life, uh, often set in barbershops and utilizing repurposed materials. And has a show right now at City Hall, correct? Yes. Okay, go see it. Um, these works tend to have narratives, but there's no one story as viewers bring their own experience to each piece. He holds a doctorate in museum education from Columbia University and worked previously for the Institute of Museums and Library Services, a federal agency, first as deputy director for museums, then as counselor to the director. And he currently teaches museum studies to graduate students. Cynthia Sands, who was shy but is up here, I'm glad to say, <laughs> in collaboration with uh, Ghanaian Carver Aouda, has created a series of finely designed and sculpted dolls inspired by the traditional African Akuaba carvings and African folklore. The hand-painted dolls in the series are uniquely designed and bring to life the wisdom of our African ancestors. Cynthia uh, <coughs> spent her formative years in Washington, D.C., graduating from Howard University School of Fine Arts in 1971. Amani Russell is somewhere here. Oh, there she is, thank you. Uh, is the creator of Indigo's Friends Art Dolls and Notions and owner of Indigo's Friends Studio in Brentwood, Maryland. She's a largely self-taught doll maker, designer, and fiber artist drawing on influences from the arts of her mother and her maternal grandmother. Both created hand-stitched utilitarian quilts and other wonderful things from worn clothing, found objects, and unusual objects. She began creating Indigo's Friends cloth dolls in the early 1990s. Paula Whaley uh, began working with clay as a healing tool in 1992. She's a sculptor and traditional doll maker. She says, my work has always been concerned with the act of making art as a source of healing. With figurative expression as her primary focus, her art is also allows her to connect with others who respond to this theme. So many aspects of human experience find ways into her work, she says. She's captivated by the ephemeral nature of life, the role of gesture, and subtle combinations of elements. Mm -hmm. The underlying spirit within makes each figure an expression of deep personal reflection. Have I missed anyone? Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> Here, oh, well, myself too. Okay, Here we go. I told you, I'm winging it, y'all. Um, Francine Haskins is a doll maker, painter, and author of children's books. Her art reflects her experiences as growing up in Washington, D.C. Francine is one of the premier doll makers in our country. Uh, her work as painter, illustrator, and multimedia textile artist has been exhibited in major institutions throughout the country, including the Smithsonian's Museum of African American History and Culture. She has trained and supported countless individuals in the pursuit of the arts. 
and Linda Cotto is member of the Society for the Sacred Heart of Jesus, a progressive international order of Catholic nuns founded in 1800 with the mission to make God's love visible in the world with a focus on education, human development, and promotion of social justice. She studied doll making with Gwendolyn Daniels at Montgomery College in Maryland and found that doll making is a wonderful medium in these polarized times for engaging people and conveying important facts about the world in the ways that cut across fault lines of ideology, race, ethnicity, gender, culture, socioeconomic class, and age. Her dolls are accompanied with the accounts of the lives of the women they portray and wear clothing that carefully replicates uh, fashions of their time. The doll she will present is a tribute to Eliza Nebit, the first enslaved person who was gifted by the Bishop of New Orleans to her order when, it was members, when its members first arrived in the U.S. in 1818. Now, I think I've got everybody here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, myself, yes. <laughs> it's weird to introduce yourself. Well, I'm Deborah Grayson, uh, and I am a printmaker, painter, and doll maker. Born and raised right here in Washington, D.C., also in Montgomery County, Maryland. I hold a BA from Maryland and an MA PhD at Michigan State where I studied American Studies. And the work that I do is really focused on quiet. If you haven't read Kevin Kwashi's book, you should, Sovereignty of Quiet, I think it's called. And it's very much focused on interiority. It's how uh, black people, black women in particular, how we interact with ourselves kind of outside of the external gaze of others. So that's what my work is about. All right, thank you. Okay, so we're gonna begin with Linda. Okay. Forgive me, I'm really short. Can you hear me? Um, okay. All right. <laughs> um, can you hear me? Okay, all right. Is the, okay, good, all right. Um, um, my name is, again, Linda Cato. I'm a Catholic nun of the U.S. Canada province of the Society of the Sacred Heart. I am also a doll artist uh, who specializes in making portrait dolls of women who had an important impact on their communities or societies, often those whose significance is not widely known in the West. I have here a, 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 a doll um, that I made about a year and a half ago of Eliza Nevitt. She was likely a mixed race um, uh, slave who was uh, gifted to my order by the Bishop Dubourg of New Orleans when our sisters first arrived from France um, to the United States in uh, 1818. The um, doll is based on a, a studio portrait that the nuns commissioned in the late 1870s or early 1880s, after the, well after the emancipation. She represents for me the, um, in, it's an honor, uh, it's a tribute to the uh, many enslaved persons whose labor um, helped to found and expand the institutions we operated in Louisiana and in Missouri prior to the Civil War. The use of slave labor is part and parcel of the history of the church and of religious orders of nuns and priests who came to the U.S. prior to the 1820s. In those days, um, there was a lot of anti-Catholic persecution in the former English colonies further north, and so many landed in Louisiana and in um, uh, uh, Missouri, as well as Maryland. Um, and unfortunately, these were um, states that were where slavery was firmly entrenched. In 2016, prior to the, um, uh, in preparation for the 200th anniversary of my order's founding in the United States, the order issued a mandate calling for a thorough study and accounting of our history of using slave labor prior to the Civil War in Louisiana and Missouri. We wanted to identify all the persons who worked as slaves on our institutions, whether we owned them or not, and then also to contact identify and contact any living descendants of theirs for the purposes of engagement, apology, and recompense. Now, the extensive, oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I haven't moved the, forward. The extensive genealogical research was conducted by sisters Maureen Chequin and sister Irma Dillard, who are members of my order, as well as a research consultant, Emery um, Weber. 
I can talk to you more about that uh, separately, but we just don't have time. Um, how did we become slave owners? We were co-opted by the dominant slaveholding um, culture of the uh, former French territories in Louisiana and Missouri. And we were also cloistered at the time. So here are these foreign French nuns coming to uh, the area and who were dependent heavily on the slaveholding landowners and clergy for information and guidance. Um, and uh, many of their, these were uh, la slaveholding landowners whose daughters attended our schools that we operated in Missouri and Louisiana. These young women often entered our order afterwards and had the mentality that slaveholding was part of nature and God's will. And they often even uh, brought slaves from their families as um, part of their inheritances when they entered the, um, the order. The numbers of slaves um, are you can see here are actually estimates. We don't have, um, you know, because of the complexity of the um, documents, researching and so forth, we don't have a complete number. But um, this is what we have so far. And it's based uh, for the period of 1818 through the uh, prior to the Civil War. And notice that these are not just, uh, many of them were slaves that were, whose labor was uh, rented to us or uh, gifted to us um, or lent to us, often uh, by parents in lieu of tuition. Um, some were um, outright purchased, and I'll go into that a little bit more. The rationale for either using or not using uh, slavery in Missouri and Louisiana by our nuns seems to be primarily economic. Um, as um, Camilla pointed out, there was considerable resistance by um, enslaved um, persons who we um, utilized. They um, uh, it was Why would they bother to work hard. There was no incentive, obviously. And so they resisted um, um, vigorously, and many of them ran away. We have a lot of records of breakage of equipment and tools and so forth that had to be replaced. Um, there were slowdowns, work stoppages, and so forth, to the point that our foundress, Mother Philippine Duchenne, who was canonized a few years ago, said that, um, you know, she was complaining that it takes um, eight adult Negroes to do what one French girl can do in the same time. So this is, you know. And so, I, I apologize. And a, a very illustrative example is of Emmy in Missouri. She was gifted to us by the Bishop of St. Louis. And she um, was very vocal in her resistance and um, threatened to burn the school down, burn the convent down, to kill herself, to kill the nuns, to kill the, her husband, et cetera, et cetera. And so Philippine finally sold her, and her comment about it at the time was to say that her new owner is very stern and likely to be more severe with her and therefore extract her obedience. So um, when the... Uh, in Missouri, because there was a um, uh, very close to the harbor in um, St. Louis and had ready access to free, uh, freedmen as well as Irish immigrants who were coming in from the boatloads from Ireland fleeing English persecution, they quit using slave labor early on in the 1820s. However, the, if you, um, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> if you look at the map that um, the, um, in the uh, sites in Louisiana are far from New Orleans, and therefore they didn't have access to Irish immigrant labor or to a lot of freed, um, freedmen in New Orleans. And so that's where we have the first record of buying a, an enslaved person. He was Frank Hawkins, who was purchased for our Academy of the Sacred Heart in Grand Coteau in 1823. I'm going to have to skip that one because we don't have time. Um, it's, the nuns were seemed to be very concerned about complying with Catholic teaching concerning slave ownership. Unlike um, uh, the English, the Lat in Lat early on in Latin America, the Catholic Church um, finally acknowledged that um, enslaved persons and indigenous persons had souls, and therefore slave owners did not have absolute right over uh, to control over um, the, in their enslaved persons, as was common in um, the former English colonies and U.S. Fed, U.S. law about slavery. So it was really an incentive for enslaved persons to seek conversion and baptism and marriage within the church. A family unit, any children and of those units, uh, unions could not, the family could not be separated and sold separately as individuals. So, um, and not only that, but our sisters in the, um, in Louisiana made a 
a real practice of trying to reunite families. So for example, Frank Hawkins, um, who's, he left a wife and children behind in Maryland with his free, uh, previous owners, and so they went around, uh, made efforts to reunite the family of purchasing all of those family members. So that was one positive thing. However, and I'll, you know, there's a lot <laughs> worse, but we do see some I just wanted to make sure you saw some uh, images of some of the gorgeous uh, work they did at, uh, for example, Grand Coteau in our academy there. All the buildings were built by them, the bricks made by them, the beautiful carpentry. These are living testimonies to their wonderful craftsmanship. Um, nevertheless, um, there, it, it's, I, it's horrible to say, but there, in our records, we have no moral condemnation ever being expressed um, about slavery as an institution. They just complained about whether it was for a good source of labor or not. And we sold enslaved pers in persons, whether they were family year or not. We did um, sell people. Um, we have, uh, uh, they never, there's not a single instance of them having freed a slave until they were forced to at the end of the Civil War. And they discouraged and forbade efforts by slaves to try to find ways to buy their own freedom. Um, during the, the Civil War, they were stolid defenders of the Confederacy, um, even though when the gunboats of the Union armies were already on the river outside of um, our school in St. Michael. And um, they, uh, the, certainly slaves were fleeing at this point. They refused to pay them the wage recognized by, you know, uh, in, uh, that the Union Army uh, required uh, to, for their labor. Uh, one positive story is that um, Stanislaus and Martin Jackson, who were two brothers, and John Clem, who were, who were slaves at St. Michael's, who fled from them at, when the Union Army came, they um, fled to join the uh, first colored, uh, Union Colored Regiment, and their records are found in veterans' uh, pension um, records. After the Civil War, thank goodness, um, there, uh, there was a, con uh, the order expanded across into Canada and well into across the continent, and the, the, the practices were done. Uh, many of them uh, joined the civil rights um, protests, um, and there were many women of color who entered the order and were welcomed. It was a very uh, different day, and this is a photo of Mothers Green and Kane, who came with their students in full habit um, from the uh, art college outside of Chicago, marching uh, in the voter rights protests in Selma, Alabama. Um, the mandate did call for us to identify and reach out to living descendants, which was another um, big process. The, many of them were quite happy to receive the information because they had done their own genealogical research and couldn't find anything beyond the uh, uh, be more behind back, back beyond the 20th century. We had in 2018 in September a celebration at our school in Grand Coteau to uh, of all the descendants of those who were who, who worked there. And uh, it was quite a celebration. Um, so many came, and they designed the uh, the uh, mass and all the uh, rituals of uh, memor uh, memorials um, there themselves. There were many Afro-Caribbean elements, and you can see the um, uh, m memorial uh, that were done at the. Um, uh, Cemetery, and finally, um, there was a scholarship set up, 100% uh, tuition for students, uh, African American students, to attend the school, and um, uh, and a, a mandate for the sisters to address our own racist attitudes and white privilege within our own organization and in our um, uh, advocacy um, around the globe. I just didn't, I didn't want to close without saying, expressing my heartfelt uh, sorrow and apologies for all of you who are descendants of enslaved persons. This was horrific on the part of my order to have been involved in, in complicit to this degree. And as a person of color, I, I cannot tell you how horrible I feel about this. And I'm very grateful for you to, for having me here and giving me the opportunity to share this information. Thank you very much. Thank you, Linda. Uh, so the next three uh, presenters will be talking about reclaiming identity in an order of presentation, Dr. Schroeder, uh, Francine Haskins, and Paula Whaley. Good afternoon. I'm gonna be talking about my I'm going to be speaking about my work as a puppeteer and also as a museum educator because my, I operate in the realm of museums. Like many puppeteers, I played with puppets as a child. Um, I stopped playing with them when I was in junior high school because it wasn't so cool anymore. 
<laughs> but I picked it up again when I was in college and undergrad because I had an amazing uh, sculptor instructor, Martin Perrier, who was making these incredible kites. And I said, so why are you doing kites? And he said, well, I just, I'm doing kites now because I played with kites when I was a child, and I want to know how I respond to them right now as an adult. And I thought, well, for me, that would have been puppets. So let me find out how I feel about puppets now that I'm an adult. <laughs> and one thing led to another. Um, I started studying puppetry in undergrad, and I landed um, a position with a puppet master in Chicago, and I stayed with him for two summers while I worked at the Art Institute of Chicago. So during the daytime, I was at the Art Institute of Chicago as a museum educator, and in the evening, I would go to this guy's warehouse loft up on the fifth floor in an area where no one was supposed to be living at that time. Um, but he did live there, and that's where his puppet studio was. So I would spend my evenings learning puppetry from him. I took those, those skills back to the University of Michigan, and that became one of my minors. Um, I was doing rod puppets. This is an example of a rod puppet. Later on, I landed a job at the Anacostia Museum in Washington, DC, and I thought, well, I'm a museum educator. I'm also a puppeteer. Let me put these skills to work. So I started using puppetry as a way to help young children become interpreters in the museum. So this is the, this is the, the Anacostia Museum's puppet theater. I also experimented with different forms of puppetry. I was interested in bunraku, which is a Japanese form. So I had a young lady sculpt, or sew, a large doll, essentially. Now the, thing, the distinction between a doll and a puppet is dolls are usually for intimate play and interaction. Puppets are a form of a doll, but their primary purpose is to perform. This puppet was Akil, and he did the narration for um, the interpretation of African exhibitions at the Anacostia Museum. I had a chance to work with the Smithsonian Institution of um, Exhibits, uh, Sites, Traveling Exhibits. They were putting together an exhibition of 360 music sheet covers. And they thought, this is going to be really dry and dull. We have to come up with something to make it interesting. So um, they contacted me and I said, well, let's come up with a puppet. His name is Ragtime Rochelle, and he knows all of these musicians. And he's just gonna win, he's just gonna spin stories about these guys and connect them with the sheet music covers. So we traveled around. We started off in Davenport, Iowa, and just traveled around the country with Ragtime Rochelle. Later in the 80s, I became interested, became interested in African puppetry, and I thought, I want to find out what Africans did with their puppetry. So I would go to primarily West Africa. So I would land in a major city, find a safe hotel, drop my bags, and I would travel around the country looking for puppets. This is a puppet from, uh, I found it in Dakar. Uh, it's, a, it's a ram, a ram's head. The, the head is made out of wood, and the, the calorie shells emulate the wool. This is an example of a puppet um, in African traditional form. The puppet itself is on top of the puppeteer's head. The puppeteer is fully clothed. And I, I was really fascinated with that notion that the puppeteer is in full view but clothed. Mm -hmm. I found this puppet in, in Ghana, uh, I'm sorry, in Mali, and she became one of my characters in a fairy tale talking about colors. She's the color wizard. This is another puppet from Mali. In traditional African puppetry, the performances are usually outdoors and sometimes they're on the river. So I was fascinated by a performance that took place um, on the river. And if you look at this, you can see the canoe, the puppeteers in the canoe. That, stru that structure in the middle is actually the puppet stage. So the puppeteers are underneath where the raffia is and the puppets would, would appear in the back of the, of the animal. The audience would stand on the river, and usually this is not a performance, this is preparation for a performance, but usually the performances are at night, so there's even more magic there because all you can see is the lit canoes in the dark and the people are standing on the banks of the river. Oh my when I was at Studio Museum in Harlem, I decided we we're gonna have another puppet theater, so we introduced puppets again. Sometimes I construct puppets that are African influence, and this is a raffia, um, slash wood puppet with a piece of fabric attached to it. This is Africa brown, made out of plastic wood and fiber. At the time, Mayor Koch got in on the, on the action, so he played with some puppets at Studio Museum in Harlem. I wanted to do something for adults in museums because I thought all of our programs were just very serious. I worked at the Getty Museum in, in California, and later at the Baltimore Museum of Art, and I thought, I want to do a puppet that only deals with adults. So we came up with Miss Lily. 
Miss Lily is a bona fide museum docent. She has a tag. She only gives tours to adults. <laughs> She's outside. You can see her there. <laughs> This is Mr. Zeke. Mr. Zeke is a narrator for a show called Underground Railroad, Not a Subway. Mm. Again, that was a museum story. <laughs> the notion for that came when I was talking to a group of high school students in New York, and I said, you guys know about the Underground Railroad, right? Ah. Said, yeah, man, everybody knows that. That was a subway that helped black people get the freedom. <laughs> I thought, we, got, we have work to do here. Okay. So that's how the Underground Railroad Not a Subway story came apart, and I'm, I'm using different forms of puppetry. Here I'm using wood cutouts, and this is a scene of a cabin where a runaway boy it meets um, a white family that's going to help him get to the next station. Sometimes the performances are outdoors, and I was really thrilled to be able to perform at Oakley Cabin, which is an historic space in in Maryland. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell you the thrill I had having the puppets do the Underground Railroad not a subway right in front of this cabin. Mm -hmm. The audience was outdoors. Mm -hmm. This is Mr. Zeke speaking to, um, this is a mysterious black woman who actually shows up in the, in the story. I did not make this one. This is actually a doll made by a friend of mine who insists that she's always a doll. Mm -hmm. And I take her dolls and say, no, she's now a puppet. <laughs> <laughs> she's performing, she's got work. Um, another show is about the Harlem Renaissance, and this is a puppet, uh, Gaby Real, who's a DJ. He's got a show that talks about the Harlem Renaissance, and that story unfolds. We had a part, an opportunity to work with the National Air and Space Museum when they were honoring Tuskegee Airmen. Mm -hmm. Tevin actually met the Tuskegee Airmen, and in his, and his presentation, he deals with young children. We weren't quite sure who would show up at a show. Most of you who work in libraries and museums and you're putting together a program, unless you have a dedicated audience, you really don't know who's gonna show up until those doors open. Mm -hmm. So I had to be prepared for whoever showed up. Apparently, there were a lot of kids who were just learning the alphabet. <laughs> so Tevin um, convinced, this, convinced the audience that he knew how to draw the letter T. It took him five times to learn the letter T. And the kids said, no, that's not a letter T, that's not a letter T, that's not a letter T, and finally got the T for Tuskegee. Oh, no. That's Tuskegee. I wanna go back. I'm not going back. Okay, so in that presentation, um, Tevin has a, a large sack, it's an African sack, and it's filled with things, and he says, I've got things that can fly, I'm gonna show you the things I have that can fly. And he pulls out a gorilla and said, a gorilla can fly. No, no, a gorilla can't fly. Okay, 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 I got another thing. A boat can fly. No, 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 a boat can't fly. Finally, he comes up with a bird. A bird can fly. A bird can fly because it has wings. And we were in the, the National Air and Space Museum, so we're surrounded by planes. Tevin starts talking about birds and wings. That transforms into a conversation about planes and wings, and we start walking around the museum and looking at the actual airplanes in the spot. Lately, I've been um, performing with other puppeteers in the Maryland region. Um, we have puppet slams. A puppet slam is when you bring a bunch of puppeteers together. They each have about eight to 10 minutes on stage, and they do whatever they want to do. This is Dirk <laughs> Joseph and his daughter, and they use rod puppets. Oh my God. Sarah and Olmsted um, infuse puppetry with theatrical stories. Kuroji is from Silver Spring. He does work with younger children. This is Ms. Lily. I'm sorry, this is not Ms. Lily, I'm sorry, I apologize, that, that's, that's Maya opinion. <laughs> <laughs> this is Miss Lily, and when, when Miss Lily's not doing tours for adults, she's uh, lately been doing blues songs, and this particular song is by Etta James, it's called, If I Can't Sell It, I Will Sit Down Upon It. <laughs> you might know that song, it's about a chair. Yeah. <laughs> Miss Lily has also recently done tours in the, Af the African American Museum on the Mall. Uh, here she's talking about the Harriet Tubman mm -hmm. shawl that was given to Harriet Tubman by Queen Victoria. The museum wanted to highlight six items that were in the collection, so we did a tour just mm -hmm. highlighting those objects. Here she's talking about a Bible that belonged to Nat Turner. Two shows that are going on right now. This is a show about the Children's Crusade, where we're talking about children in the Civil Rights Movement. In this story, DeAndre, who is also outside, is actually narrating the story, and he's operating other puppets as he tells the story. The storyline is he, he's got a very strict grandfather. He finds out one day that his grandfather went to jail as a kid, and he really wants to know the backstory about this. Turns out his, his grandfather was a member of the Children's Crusade. 
So in the scenes, he's operating these puppets. These are wood cutouts. And finally, uh, this show is called How the Sun Came to the Sky, another show where the puppet is, is manipulating other puppets. And that's it. Thank you. And I really don't, I feel out like a fish out of water, but anyhow, I'm a mixed media, mixed media fiber artist, and dolls actually ended up being my forte. I wrote, I, I wrote a couple of little things that I have on different quilts. Finding Francine with art, word, family, Faith, life, finding out I was not lost, just hiding. I'm an introvert, and I stand up in front of you speaking because of art. I see the invis invisible, I hear the inaudible, I speak the unquestionable, I am an artist, I'm a creative force. I create art with this little girl. <sighs> This is me, who stood in corners, listened to people talk. Sometimes I knew when they were talking, they were talking, they were just talking. They weren't getting information, but I listened to my Aunt Lawrence, my mother's older sister, tell about stories of our family. Didn't realize that I was going to use that later on. I didn't know what I was going to do. I felt like a, the black sheep. I, I didn't fit in. I was the little brown skinned girl with the little short hair, little skinny legs, mm -hmm. quiet. I didn't look like everybody else in the family. And, and adults tend to talk about kids thinking they don't hear things. So you internalize and then you move on because some days you wish, why was I born? Why was I put here? Why was I in this family? And then as you grow, because you were chosen to be created to heal others who you thought when the pastor's green on the other side, it's not. Usually right where you are is the, where you need to be. So in my little, when I start after high school, I'm not, it's too, I can tell you the story I told them in the car of me walking away from school when I was a little girl. My mother was a school teacher who had all kinds of honors, went to Dunbar, went to Howard on scholarships. My father gradu uh, didn't graduate. He didn't finish high school. He got on the train from Wilson, North Carolina, going to New York, stopped in D.C., crashed the party, and saw that pretty brown-skinned little girl up in the corner who was my mother, and they came together. They were two different kinds of people, but came from the same kinds of backgrounds. So when I graduated from high school, what was I going to do? I went, my mother asked, what are you going to do? So <laughs> she did ask that. Way. So art was something that I used to, uh, that I always did. And I, did, I was a daydreamer. This is one of my earliest <laughs> pieces of art that my mother said. <laughs> she, uh, so... I say art school, so I went, uh, applied for the Corcoran School of Art. This is back in the 60s. Wow. Got in on probation. Didn't realize then, but I know now, that as an artist, you can, have, you can create your own job. I thought the only way you can make money as an artist was to be a, 
uh, advertising design person. So that's what I took. After, after Garfinkel's four, four years after the, I learned all the printmaking and all that kind of stuff, the academic stuff, I, along the way you meet people that are going to end up showing you the way to go, where you're going to end up. I met Percy Martin, who was working for uh, Topper Carew in Adams Morgan. That was my first job. After I left there, I went to Garfinkel's. Those of you who know D.C. Garfinkel's was the Fufu Shishi <laughs> department store on the corner of 14th and F that black people couldn't really, couldn't go in. If they went in, they had to buy the item and they couldn't try it on. So in 1972, things had opened up a little bit. I needed a job, went in there for uh, Christmas help, stayed for 13 years, which was one of the best things I ever did because Garfinkel's taught me discipline as an artist. Because even though I went to Corcoran, I didn't believe I was an artist. Discipline as an artist and how to market my work or tell a story with um, merchandise. Plus, I met the woman I worked with her who was to get me later where I am now. Worked there for 13 years, started developing my style. In the 70s, I got tired of sending out white images on a note card, so I folded a piece of paper and drew my image there. Then I started drawing African Americans or my, my community the way I saw it, not on the surface, not a white image painted brown, but I would go deep, and that's why I tell any artist, go deep, don't be on the surface, go deep. After I had it up, I, I was like, here, it's time for me to go and step out on faith. So May 28th, 1985, I quit my nine, nine to five job and st stepped out to be an artist. And through the times I've had two shops, been at Adams Morgan, 12th Street, doll making, Anacostia Museum, Children's Museum, because people start calling you if you're doing the right thing. Children's book, because someone saw my art, and I was just, I walk, on, I walk in faith, because I, I live on the edge, so I have to be faithful. Um, after uh, Belmont closed, there's a, there's a lot of stuff in between, and a, a lot of these people sitting up here, we've traveled, we've cried, we've done things together. This is my community. but. Um, my, house, my niece helped, well, she did, renovated my house that I live in, the house I moved to from 121 to Northeast. I still live in the, fam the family house. Renovated it, and that offered me a, a chance. I opened my house as my studio, showroom, have my friends come. It's, it's, it's open. My mother was very close. I'm open. I'm open. Fast forward 30 years, my friend Amy at, at Garfinkel's, who I worked for, was now working at the African, um, National African American Museum, History and Culture. And she called me, what kind of dogs do you have? I'm like, oh, oh, really? I wasn't trying to get in because I knew everybody was trying to get in, you know. And so now, for the last three years, four years, I um, sell my things in the museum shop, and we're working on projects. And just keep on doing your art. If you're an artist, don't be afraid. Go deep. Get that pain out. Work with that pain, because that's what it's there for. Help you work and move on. So. Mm. Thank you. Uh, this, I didn't talk. OK. This, this is the way I started with the dogs. This is a simple pattern, like a gingerbread doll with um, notions and scraps. This is part of where I've gone. I see dolls in everything. I see art in everything. Um, I deal sometimes in con. This, I have the doll on the quilt. 
have thou have quilt, but I also deal in thought pro provo provocative, provoking, what's the word, whatever. Provocative. <laughs> <laughs> whatever, but um, the issue with the brown paper bags, it's called the brown paper bag test, not darker than a brown paper bag, because that was the test. My mother went to Dunbar because she was just on the edge. Her sisters went to Armstrong because they were a little browner. Mm. And this was, this is how African Americans were uh, discriminating against each other in the society. So lots of times I like to do things that if you walk by, you might, you might feel bad and that's good because you need to remember. That's it. Oh. Good afternoon, good morning to everyone. Bear with me. This is my first. Okay, so uh, don't stop. <laughs> first, I would just like to say I'm blessed and I'm grateful to be in the room with some of the most incredible artists on the planet. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I became, I guess, what you would call a doll artist. Um, dolls were not my background. I came, uh, I was started fashion merchandising. A lot of people get mad at me because my teacher, some of you know who my teacher was, when people say, are you serious? But I was in an art class in Harlem, from Harlem, New York, uh, on 35th Street area, the people in here that know that area, um, way back before a lot of you that I know here was born. Vander Z had a shop on 7th Avenue Mm. near um, Smalls, the 7th Avenue area. And as a child, I'm a child from nine children, I'm the last one, mm. um, walked into Harriet Beecher store, junior high school on the hill. And not knowing at the time, there was a credible black woman who became my art teacher. And that's really why I went into fashion. And her name, well, to, to me, she, it was her first job. I did not know that. She was just out of school, Faith Ringo Wallace. Some of you know who she is. And that is why I went into fashion, because she was one of the most incredible black women that I had ever seen in Harlem. And between Faith Ringo Wallace and peeping in the window of Van Der Zee's shop, that was it for me, <laughs> okay? So that's my background was fashion. Um, later on, much later in my life, um, I, I did have a fashion line. I traveled all over. I did hats. I had windows at Bloomingdale's. I worked at B. Altman. I did uh, all sorts of retailing. I dressed models, some of the top models that all of you probably would, would know today, Imam, all of them. I dressed and did coordination for them at a place in, on Rockefeller Center called Fashion Group. Um, in 87, uh, I lost my older brother, who was a father. He was my father. He was more than my brother. Uh, he happened to, uh, he was the oldest. And I look back now because I say to myself, my God, my father died the same day I was born. Some of you know it, some of you don't. Uh, and I'm starting to imagine how does a 19-year-old with a mother in the hospital giving birth to her last child having to bury his father. So that's part of the connection that I had with my older brother because he was much older than me and he was like a father. And one story is, is funny. Uh, because my father died on the same day I was born, uh, his sister said to my mother and my brothers, you have to name her Mercy because she was born on a merciful day. So my brother stepped in and said, no, I'm, I'm going to name her. So thank God that I'm not walking around 
being mercy. My name is, he named me Paula Maria, and thank God for that. <laughs> um, I lost my brother, father, in 87, and it was the first death that I had ever dealt with, that kind of pain, and I didn't think that I was going to recover. Mm -hmm. And I was in Atlanta, and a young man, I did not know, some of you may know this story, I think it had, at some point it may have been in print. He stopped me and he looked at me and he said, you're in great trouble. He said, uh, if you want to stay on the planet, he said, put your hands in some clay. Mm -hmm. He said, it'll be very healing and very therapeutic. And here I stand. Mm -hmm. I ended up early 90s, Washington DC in a carriage house with starting to make things manipulate with this clay. Uh, how gauze came into it, it just did, because we know what gauze can do is a part of a healing tool. And um, I was in this carriage house for quite some time, and I really didn't think I was gonna make it. And um, again, simply because of uh, who my brother, some of you know, but I remember, I look back, Tony Morrison and Tony Cave and Burr came and it was dark, and they looked and they said, you have to come out of here. You have to share this work. And not long after, that's when my work really began. I did do a residency at the um, Kennedy Center, so I was in DC, Virginia, with workshops, um, dealing with mainly young children. And as a lot of you know, or we know, that that was the crack epidemic. Mm. So it was very difficult during that time because it was more of nurturing these children. Uh, the art came second, the nurturing came first. But um, what has, in terms of my work, I don't have any here, you've seen it. My purpose, simply because I'm standing here, and I feel that I have survived up until this point. That work in the clay has helped to heal me from that point on. So I owe all of you and I owe my ancestors uh, in terms of honoring them every day of my life. So before I, when I get up in the morning, before I touch clay, okay, I give thanks. Mm. Okay, because I'm standing and we're all still here. Mm -hmm. And I, it, it's, it's no more for me to say, but basically that's my healing. That's been my healing. You can look at the work now and you can see, oh, a lot of you know, and she just bought a piece of my work that I can't even believe it. I didn't even recognize it. So I know that there's a creator because I'm standing here and you, some of you know how the work has evolved. Joanna here sitting here has so much of my work, a lot of you do. And um, it has been a great healing from what I'm told for others. And so I'm just happy and glad that I was able to share and hopefully continue to do that. Thank you. Very powerful on what would have been Toni Morrison's birthday, if I'm not mistaken, which is today. So the second half of our uh, presentation is focused on Afrofuturism. And first we'll hear from Cynthia and then Kabibi, and then we'll open it up for questions and discussion. <coughs> Thank you for having me. Uh, thank you, Camilla, for putting all of this all together. And thank you, panel, for setting up my outline. I got so much from you. I got from you. I got from you. Now I know what to say. I didn't know what to say, but hearing all you all, I'm going to fill in the missing gaps. So, oh, here it is. These are my ancestors. Negotiating identity, restoring community. And I, the person in this photograph that I want to emphasize is the lady to the right, Mary. Mary was my great-great-great-grandmother who was a slave. 
And going through the records, finding the will that was left, Mary and her three children left after, after the Civil War, the plantation, and finding the will and how much they were sold for, we find no other record of Mary. I think she was the original person coming to America. So I envision a lot about Mary walking along the beach or in the forest mm -hmm. as a little girl being captured. And she stays in my mind. And she is the reason why I guess I am trying to renegotiate and restore. So um, this picture means a lot to me. It was found in somebody's family album. And this uh, man to the, uh, to the left, was my father's great, great grandfather, I think. Mm. And I don't, I don't see the names, but I have the, his name is Joe. Mm. And there's Amanda, there's, I um, can't remember all the names. Oh, Cleo, I knew the woman in the back with the bow. She was Aunt Cleo, and when I met her when I was a little girl, she was real old, so I knew that woman. But anyway, this is in South Carolina. I'm from Edgefield, South Carolina, home of the, uh, uh, Dave the Potter. And I've just recently went to South Carolina to do some research on Dave the Potter. Actually, my, where I used to go was right around the corner from where Dave the Potter did his pots. I never knew that. I was there. I never knew that that was a, a, a very vibrant uh, a ceramic or pottery community until recently. But anyway, so the next slide, how do I do this? Okay, this is a poem, and I, I don't really read poems. I write them, but I don't read them. So you really have to bear with me. <laughs> Time flashes like shark, shark's teeth cutting into black flesh, plucked, looted, and ravaged by kings of other lands. Mm. The weather-beaten coastal cosbas, whitewashed and bleached, in the salt and sun by centuries of time forgotten, black saltans ascension across fertile plains, mixing and changing the complexion of the northern intrusion. Why do your eyes look north while your black mother reaches for her golden child who has, who has forgotten that once concubine soul whose breast nurtured a nation? Transparent and clear, we stand like totems from the past. Kush, Songhe, Mali, Aksum. Civilizations through time and space superimposed on ancient temples, black icons, edifices, symbols, the underpinning of society and culture rest in time and space, waiting for the veil to be lifted into the brilliant light. The ancestral spirit stood guard above our truth. I know our image will never be erased from mankind's memory, we reach inside the, we reach into the inside, pulling out all the falsehood, revealing and, con and, contribut and, and contribut mm, contributing to the foundations on which we exist in all its glory. Now this is poem was written when I was going across from Morocco across to Europe and all the way up to, and I just saw the changing, I saw the, complexions changing, and I saw our, our image, images change from uh, south to north, and I understood that a lot of the culture actually were in Africa. All the foundation was in Africa, and it went north. Okay. So I, I, I'm always interested in the ancestors. They bother me all the time. They keep asking me to do better, to be better. And so I was at the Cape Coast Castle in Ghana, and I had the, um, the priest read out the names of all the ancestors that, that my mother and father and everybody could remember. And then I took their pictures through the door of no return. And here I am with some uh, spiritual people and I'm holding up their picture. Okay, this is a picture of how I feel about being in Africa with a woman who's carrying everything, all the loads on her head, her husband, her babies, they're sucking her, they're draining her. And so I did a poem to the first uh, fossil that was uh, found, Lucy, in, the, in, the, in Tanzania or Ethiopia. I won't read that poem. <laughs> and so this is how I feel sometimes, like I'm pushing back the world, it's gonna crush me, and I'm just pushing back 
so that I won't get crushed. But I'm in a pyramid. Mm. And this is uh, just a batik, because I am a batik. I'm a textile fiber artist first. Oh, and this is my interpretation of being in a boat, the diaspora, spinning and spinning, being, uh, going into the middle passage. That's just a drawing. Whew, I don't want to read any more poetry. I have a lot. <laughs> oh, I want to read that. So these are just, okay, these are just images because I was out of my house for several years, two years, and I just started drawing and doing this on the computer, just these little computer drawings. Lots of little computer. Now, I was in Ghana and I went to a festival where the women were being, um, this is a, um, what do you call it, uh, initiation festival where the girls were turning pu pu pubic into puberty. And so they, they had a lot of beads and it was very interesting. Okay, this is the beginning. I've lived in the Congo for four years. In 1976, I went to the Congo. And this is my first art exhibit in the Congo, the first picture. That's Uganda, that's an art exhibit in Uganda. I'm painting in my apartment in, a, in DC, and I'm doing some, I use, I'm a batik artist, so I'm doing my batik. And then this, that's a picture of me in U, uh, Guyana. I lived in Guyana, and then a picture in Tacoma Park, where I live now. And this is, a, this is my studio in Tacoma Park. And all this, this is a cutout. It's huge, and I'm, it's all paste. I'm pasting tiny little pieces of cloth on that uh, painting. Now, I love to watch artists paint, I mean, uh, uh, carve. So I'm working with this guy, Awudu, who I do. He does the carving for me, and I, and, uh, and, and, um, I paint the, I paint the uh, uh, statues because I don't like carving, but I love painting. <laughs> So I take all the work that I see, you know, uh, old carvings and stuff that nobody wants, and I just paint them. Mm -hmm. And I kind of, this is how I started. I started with just cut up drawings. I just reconfigured the uh, Akua doll because it's a traditional doll. And Akua was a woman who couldn't bear children. Ba means doll. So she went to a diviner, and she says, please, I can't have a baby. And in Ghanaian society, you have to have children. This is the, uh, this is the Akan society. You must have a girl. That fascinated me. Must have a girl? Wow. Mm -hmm. So they want a girl. They want a girl child because it's, it's matrilineal society. So I started with these drawings, and then I said, oh, mm, these drawings would look good if I actually painted them. So I gave these designs to a carver. He came to my house in my backyard, and we sat together, and he carved the dolls. And for 15 years, I carried these un unpainted dolls around, white wood. I just couldn't do it. I couldn't get to it. And so one day, my husband left, and I said, oh, I'm so lonely. So I, I, I painted them all up. I just painted, I painted, like, when he got home, he had a whole, he had a whole new family. <laughs> and so... So these are the inspirations of the dolls that I own and how I transformed them. I looked at the doll, I said, hmm, okay, I'm gonna make you like this. So this is how, this is what I do. I love taking a, a traditional things and bringing, bringing it to the future or make it, it more contemporary. Mm -hmm. the, and I tried I to do those. cloth dolls. This is my first attempt, but I love making fabric. And so I, I made the fabric for all of these pieces. Mm. And I love sticks. I saw these sticks along, the fufu pounding sticks. I love them. And so I would see them and I would buy them all. Mm. He said, oh, madame? I said, yeah, all. <laughs> and then I took them home and I, Kuba cloth, I love Kuba. I lived in the Congo for four years and I got uh, fascinated with Kuba cloth. So what I did was took Kuba designs and incorporate it on the, on the mm -hmm. and this is very difficult to paint. This is no joke. Mm -hmm. Painting those was no joke. Mm -hmm. And I love fabric. Mm -hmm. So I started a business called Entuma. Entuma means fabric in Twi, the Ashante language. So these are all the fabrics that I designed in my studio oh, God. Oh, in Ghana. <laughs> And I work with a team of people, at least five people work with me, mm. because that is a very labor-intensive activity. Taking the wax out is no joke. No joke. And I hope to teach it here in D.C. in my studio. And this is my niece who's a beautiful dancer. Wow. She's actually doing a play. She's 
in Miami right now. She's the first wife of Louis Armstrong. And I hope it goes to Broadway. But that's Dion Figgins. She's a beautiful dancer. So she said, Aunt Cynthia, let me come and um, that's the doll Camilla that I did in the class. I can't find it. Okay. <laughs> but this is my niece and all the fashions in my backyard. And these are some of the dresses that a lot of you all say you wear. These dresses. And a lot of them have been, I sold a ton of them. Market dress. And now I'm collaborating with this man in Morocco. And I just was in Morocco for Christmas. And this is, um, this is uh, Moulet. He's, he's a fabulous um, textile person, home decor specialist. And he, it, he's been making my clothes for me now. Mm -hmm. And there we are at his house. Nice. And uh, that's in, uh, this is probably uh, in December 28th or 9th. And this is, this is his studio. He made that jacket for me. Mm. We were, he loves mud cloth, and he used to do a lot of mud cloth clothes. So when I bought him some mud cloth, he went, he went crazy. Mm. It's gorgeous. And there's, he, there's his top designer. He's the cutter. He can cut anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and his workshop is just huge. Mm. And these are some of the coats oh, we made. Oh, gorgeous. And so... He's salivating. Uh-oh. Okay, now what I did was I love uh, adinkra cloth. So what I did was I took the adinkra concept, finished? Okay, uh, <laughs> took the adinkra concept and put it onto in a batik form. And these are the stamps that I use. So I took that, you know, and made batik out of it. Mm. Now this is a class that I taught in Guyana. Guyana, these women were very poor women living on the edge of the rainforest in Linden, <coughs> which was a, uh, a town that did bauxite. Bauxite industry left, they needed, they needed, a, they needed something to do. So this lady, the, I think it was the European Union asked me to come and do a class, and it was fabulous. These women were absolutely fabulous. Mm. I loved them, and uh, these are the fab, this is the end of the class. This is the certificate that they all got. But I did that for like two months. I also have a jewelry designer. I love designing jewelry. Yes, yeah, incredible. And this is the, I, I love watching people work. So whenever I go to a country, I j just go and just watch people work. Yeah. Because hands, just think if everybody used their hands, we wouldn't have guns, mm -hmm. you know? And this is my backyard in Ghana. I did something, I love red and white. Oh, it's beautiful. So these are people working. And whenever I can, I just try to learn as much as I can. But I can't do this. The guy told me, he said, Madame, you're going to have to get down on your foot or sit down and use your feet. I said, oh, no, I can't do that. <laughs> so I never did really learn how to uh, 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 tie-dye the way they tie-dye. Mm. This is one of my best friends, Ducare. He had the most beautiful shop. Chinese ruined everything. Sorry if it's any Chinese. Thing. Ruined everything. So he, he, the fabric is cheaper. You can't get the dyes. Everything is an import. So that raises the prices of, of stuff. The used clothing comes into the country. It's just ruining the, it's ruining the a, textile industry in Africa, which is really a shame. Don't send used clothes. They send them a sewing machine or some money. This is up in uh, Kamasi. People working, people working, people working. That's it. Oh. Mm -hmm. You okay? <clears throat> Greetings. Greetings. Uh, I'll just go. Shall I jump? Yeah. I'll dive. I am Kibibi Ajanku. I'm an artist, a curator, and an educator. Who am I? I make and present ethnically charged art. I'm a fiber artist who makes dolls. I'm an activist artist, and, a social, and social justice is embodied in the messaging of all that I do. The intersections may seem like a lot, yeah? Because many of you know me as a performing artist. Under that umbrella, I, many people in DC know me out of Conqueron and dancing in that way, and there are people that will come up in, to me and say, well, if you're not on the stage, I just, uh, do I, oh, 
ooh, that's you, right? <laughs> uh, 30, year, tw 30 years ago, I founded a company entitled Sankofa Dance Theater. It's based in Baltimore. And, um, <laughs> So while I don't do a whole lot on the stage anymore, I still send artists to do my favorite projects and exciting things. So there's that. I curate. I'm the, uh, the resident curator for a gallery in Fells Point. It's called the Bierman Gallery. It's in the Frederick Douglass Isaac Myers Museum that's owned by the Living Classrooms there. It sits right on the water, and it's actually on the pier that Frederick Douglass worked on as a caulker, owned by a black man, Isaac Myers. So that's pretty interesting to bring all of these intersections into that gallery. I'm an educator, and under that umbrella, I uh, lead a fellowship program for the Greater Baltimore Cultural Alliance. I am in, work in the Fine Arts Department at Coppin State University, and I'm part of a fiber, a natural dye team in the fiber department at Maryland Institute College of Art. I'm a visual artist, and my personal project is the thing of, the, those are the shoulders that I stand on because I can't breathe if I'm not making, right? But although it seems like the lo a lot, it is the combination the sum total of these things in concert all together. That's the way it's important. Yeah? So I make Afrocentric art dolls. You'll see a couple of them. These three actually are out on the table. And dolls that take shape in motion as a costume designer, because we're all just dolls, right? We're on some kind of journey, and we're telling a story. And in paper, this is from my Market Lady series. And you know, who are we if we haven't touched a paper doll, right? Mm -hmm. Kids of today kind of do it digitally, but it's the same <laughs> thing. They're dressing up something that's flat, right? Paper dolls. And in mask, this is a uh, replication. It is a reactivation of a harvest mask, a dancing mask entitled the Kumpo that literally springs up out of the tall grasses in uh, the villages of the Gambia and the villages of Casamas uh, for the uh, people that uh, dance the Akonkon, right? And in glass, you know, because sometimes when the world gets frustrating, you just have to break some glass and put it on a, a repurposed window, right? And that sometimes just has to be the story, right? But it's still that messaging. It's stall making. And in three-dimensional assemblage, yes? Because sometimes it's got to hang on the walls. Right? Still repurposed items. Still, uh, you know, some denim of today, some indigo from Mali, some glass from, from the Gambia, some, yeah? Yeah. Some bin bin from the waste, yeah? And in Afrofuturism, because everything that ever was a thought for the past has a vessel to be here in existence in real time today as a portal to our tomorrows, right? Yeah, sometimes you just gotta be funk, funky fly and you know, do it for tomorrow, right? <laughs> <laughs> and every dancer needs a tutu. <laughs> and then sometimes out straight out, evolving of the vat of indigo. You know, that natural dye vat. That thing that, that, that bubbles, you know, it, it, it's alive, it bubbles, and it, 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 it does all kinds of things. And when you dip the fabric in and pull it out, it comes out green. Mm -hmm. And when the air hits it, it turns blue. 
Mm -hmm. That's magic in and of itself. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you've got to dip the dolls in the vat mm -hmm. so they can experience that magic and touch Africa in whatever way they can. And there's one out on my table that was in the vat. One of these pair right here. It's a couple of Ibeji twins. So in truth, my work is a convergence. It's a convergence of past, present, future. It's a convergence of material, of time, of place, of the African diaspora, and the world view. Mm. Yep, coming together. You throw it in, it's, you know, it's like a, a tasty, delicious soup. You just throw it all in the pot and mix it up, and you get me. <laughs> so, my passion for fiber arts and thus doll making embodies the thrust of the movement of the African diaspora. As the daughter of two educators, my work embodies research, identity, and the gathering of elements of the African retention. And that's because I hope to evoke intuitive memories that reach back into the ancestral histories with storytelling work that impacts the here and the now. So whenever possible, as long as far back as I can go, I get out of here. Because sometimes you got to go find it so that you can inspire, be inspired in wherever you are, and hopefully inspire some people too. Some people that are younger than you, some people the same as you, some people that are older than you, some people that look like you, and some people that don't look like you. So from that standpoint, I have done a Dinkra printing on hand-woven country cloth in Kumasi, Ghana, in West Africa. I was in Cuba uh, doing, um, doing some work. I told you you've got to break some glass sometimes. So I was in Cuba doing some work uh, that had to do with found items and, and, and creating mosaic work make mosaic pieces, but I took some time to chat it up with some elders in the marketplace because I decided I'm probably going to look just like that in not so long from now. I just don't have a cigar yet, right? <laughs> <laughs> and more recently, last summer, I spent a month in Oshogbo because that is the birthplace of Yoruba Indigo. And I went to just really touch, practice, commune with, work on traditional Yoruba indigo dye practices to include a dire on through batik and a dire through uh, the cassava paste practices that go back hundreds of years. And we stand on the shoulders of that. In our, uh, in our indigo practices today, but also in our quilt making mm. legacies. Yeah. Who am I? My name is Kibibi. I make and present ethnically charged art and I am a fiber artist. I'm an activist artist working for social justice. I stand on the shoulders of the past through artistry that is rich, diverse, and creative. It is ancient, while at the same time cutting edge and always, always, always ever changing. I consider my work to be a portal that messages and inspires steps towards a more balanced and inclusive way of existence. Kee baby. Oh, there I am. Yeah, there I am. Thank you. In progress. Wonderful. Wonderful. Give me a hand. That was wonderful. Thank you. So we're
we're almost at the end of our time, but we have time for maybe two questions, depending on how fast they are. <laughs> Anyone have a question, comment? And do we have, yeah, microphone right here. Okay. Brother man, I <laughs> so much enjoyed the puppet. And I don't have a comment. My question is, when is the next puppet slam <laughs> <laughs> in this area? I actually have a date for you. It is April 4th in Baltimore at a theater called Black Cherry Puppet Theater. Okay. <laughs> Other questions? And I was told we have a few, a little bit more time, so, yeah. Uh, Linda, I'm sorry, I don't know your last, I can't I remember your yes, last name. Yes, yes. You gave me so much information that I didn't have prior to today. Do you have a book? <laughs> Our internet site? We actually have a website, um, the rscj.org. Um, we can talk afterwards because I connect you to it with all of our recent research. We're also going to be posting all the gene genealogical research that was done for people who want to use this to trace ancestors as well. I'll be happy to meet with you afterwards if that's all right. Thank okay. you. Other questions? Just going back here. Of an exhibit that's at the uh, Sandy Spring Museum. Yes, yes. And I went by last week to look at the, some of the dolls. You have a doll that features um, Joan Mulholland, who's part of, who was engaged in the civil rights. That's movement. actually our instructor, um, uh, when, Wendy Gwendolyn. Okay. What was your doll? Uh, mine were the. Um, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> my mind is blanking. Noor Jahan, the um, uh, Indian uh, Mughal Empress. The um, uh, and, and a couple of others in that one container. Okay. Uh, but all of our, our, our fellow doll artists here were at that exhibit. And how long will that exhibit be up? Uh, through March 1st. I think that's the last day. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Comment. It was excellent. <laughs> and thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. The doll artist in the audience uh, that I wanted to talk to, and that's Imani Russell. Yes. <laughs> Imani, Russell, Imani Russell's work ties in with this idea of reclamation and reasserting our history, and I wanted her to say something. Can I, why don't you, um, stand up. Whoops. And, and, and come um, so the cameras can, can catch you. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I create, um, first let me say that I'm blessed. Mm. Caught me off guard, but I was sitting over there boohooing because so many of my mentors are here, and they had no idea they were my mentors. And about 20 years ago, I came out as a doll artist. <laughs> I, <laughs> I didn't know that was a thing. <laughs> but I was creating these pieces, and I would, um, Francine Haskins, this lady showed up on my radar as I was working for the Department of Commerce, and I hated those, the environment, but you know, you paycheck and health insurance and you know and so I would go right across the street when you could go up to the monument I mean the um, what's the obelisk the monument and I would go to the top and I would sit there and I would just stitch and I would eat my lunch and just look out on the city and then get myself together so I can go back for another four hours <laughs> and I would take these little pieces and I heard about this lady named Francine and she was at 1800 Belmont and she didn't know me, but I would go to her studio, and I would drop off pieces, and I would leave. I didn't really want to hear a criticism, but I just knew that she had something going on. And I said, oh, this lady, she's unbelievable. <laughs> Long story short, um, I started making because of a friend who died in California. Went up to the mountains with her, daughter, with her children. She was going to a retreat, and Carl flipped over. She died, and her babies just mm -hmm. were there. Mm. And so I lived in California for many years, in Southern California. But, I mean, I'm sorry, in uh, Sacramento, California, so Northern California. But long story short, I pulled together. I was living in an apartment in Arlington, Virginia. I just gathered, started gathering pieces when I got the news. And I made this piece 
I didn't cry until the piece was finished. And then, so that's when I started making the pieces and I was working at Commerce, long story short. So then, Francine's there in my life, kind of, sorta. I read a book called The Sassafras, Cypress, and Indigo. Mm -hmm. I fell in love with Indigo, my mm -hmm. alter ego. Mm -hmm. um, and so that introduced me to the Gullah culture. I started doing research in the Gullah culture. And then, um, then Julie Sands, um, um, Daughters of the Dust. Mm. I'm not pronouncing her name. Dash. <laughs> Julie Dash. Dash. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Daughters of the Dust. Mm -hmm. I said, oh, I got to go down to Beaufort, South Carolina and meet those sisters mm -hmm. down there because they're going to be there. So I did that. Journaled. I took the bus on purpose. Journaled all the way down. Met the women. And I just said, oh, this is my life. The rice, the beans, the island. Mm -hmm. The beauty, the, the seagrass, the, the beautiful grass mm -hmm. baskets. One thing led to another. And then, as things started to unfold, I found myself in this community. Mm. Mm. Francine, mm. Mm. you just don't know. Francine, she never said, do it like this. Mm. She said, go deep. <laughs> <laughs> do your thing, just go deep. Mm. And eventually, I just began to evolve. I got my confidence up. Indigo's friends became a thing. Um, a woman, um, that I knew, kind of Roxanne. Does anyone know Roxanne? She used to have, she, used to, Roxanne, she had a like, right. yeah, she used to have a little studio. Right. And um, she, I started renting a space for her and I started showing my work. And I'm not really telling you guys in sequence everything, but overall, I found this beautiful community. Then I got the heart to go to Francine and I would just say, I just want to sit with you. Then the next thing you know, I've got the studio for 10 years in Brentwood, Maryland, and I just moved into a brand new studio. Mm. Um, 3807, uh, uh, this is called the Portugal, Portugal Food Studio, it is in Brentwood, Maryland, and I've been there. I'm one of five artists. There's a beautiful gallery there. I've been curating shows there myself. So I'm just, I'm still evolving. Um, I've, the dolls I love, um, and I'm now doing, uh, my, my main thing is just to, <coughs> Indigo makes me sit down and work, mm. and she also tells me, don't forget, you know, stick with that southern thing. Mm -hmm. um, stuff those dolls with beans, stuff them with cotton pods. Mm -hmm. You know, make them big. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah, make some quilts. You know how to make quilts. Just sit down and make some quilts. Oh, don't pay attention to the patterns and whatnot. <laughs> Just do your thing. <laughs> then it's the scarves. And I do most of my work from found objects and uh, uh, well-loved materials. I don't buy brand new stuff anymore. I just work from that mm -hmm. space. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the fact of the Gullah, um, I don't know why my parents are from, both of my parents were Virginians, um, and they were part of the last, mi that latter part of the, of the migration that went to Philly, so I was born and raised in Philly, but I always had a connection to the South. I was one of those girls that would go outside, jump double dutch barefoot. Mm. I was the girl that everybody sent their children to the corn row their hair, right? I was that girl. And so I think that this just a, this just a natural evolution of where I am today. I, just look forward to the future. Paula Whaley, certain people that touched my heart, Jerry Hubbard, uh, eBay Crawley, um, uh, Ingrid, and uh, um, Tanya. Tanya. I mean, I'm in this, I'm in this, this space. And you know, it's like, you, once you know, you know. You know, I didn't know that I was an artist, but I've always been evolving as an artist. I just had no idea that it would be this medium, and I love it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I was. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Can I just? Oh. Hi. I just oh. want to recognize Chris Malone sitting back in oh. the corner. Yeah. He is. He is a one of the few male doll artists. So. Yes. 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 No, I don't want to come up. <laughs> <laughs> But it's it all been said, and it's all from the heart, it's all true, and um, a question to the doll creators and the puppeteer. After you do it, after you give birth to this, after you do this creation, what do you feel? Each of you guys up there on the panel, what do you feel, what do you hear, what speaks to you? <laughs> well, I... I learned to let it go because it's, I'm, 
I'm making it for me. I mean, I'm making it with whatever energy, whatever issues I have, but the other people out there, they have the same. And it's always good to hear people tell me how they feel when they come home from a hard day of nine to five and come in and look at my pieces. So, so you're giving birth and you put them out, you get them off the tit, as they say, and you put them out there in the world so they can keep multiplying. And then you go forward. You, cre you go higher. You, you just keep going. That's good. Um, <laughs> as a puppeteer, when I'm, after I finish birthing a puppet, it actually takes on its own personality and I learn who it is. So my opinion is very different from Miss Lily, who's very different from DeAndre, who's very different from Gaby Real. They all have these, these different characters. And they're all different from Smooth Earl. And because their purpose is to perform, I often get to see who they are when they're interacting with other people. And that's ongoing. Oh, well, I don't know. Mm, how do I feel? I feel good about the art. I feel, you know, I feel like it could be better all the time. I feel like I'm searching to go higher or to go deeper into the art um, and have a sense of um, longevity. The art, you know, it's like um, it should um, be good all, all, like African art, it's always good. It's, it doesn't have, it's timeless. So the thing is I'm looking for is that timelessness where it relates to so many different people, not just one particular group, but um, so to so many different people. So that's what I'm looking for. Oh, okay, I was expecting to answer the question. For me, it's, uh, I agree with Francine, it's release, but it's always peace. Yeah. It's always peace. I, um, like I said, most people know me as a performing artist, as an African dancer, and what, what making things. And now, I started sewing when I was in elementary school, so this whole thing about making is not new and different, but surrounding the performing art, it was always about supporting something, an entity, an energy, a presence that wasn't necessarily defined by me. People, all of those things. In, my, in the current iteration of my practice, it is about finding, I'm, I'm knowing myself differently, I'm digging differently, and so every time I do something new, it is like unlocking a place and witnessing and diving and yes, giving, but also in a reciprocal kind of way that drives me to dive, dig, and give deeper, more. Um, Francine says, dig deep. I think I've only chipped the surface of the dig deep. And so I look at what's around me. I don't really sell my art, it's all around me, and it inspires me to dig deeper and do whatever mm -hmm. the next thing is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have to follow uh, Francine and Miss Grayson. I find that uh, when I finish a piece, I have a, um, I have a sense of peace, but I still struggle uh, with releasing my work. People here know that. <laughs> uh, usually, if I'm dealing with someone who wants a piece, we're back and forth about it. <laughs> and when I'm looking in the face or the eyes of that person and what that piece is starting to mean to the person, I'm able to release it. So that's what happens with me. You know that. <laughs> that's my answer. Me? Oh. I just wanted to say, first of all, I'm looking around this room, and it's taking me way back. I see some people I knew for a long time. Um, I, my question is, um, and I came in here late, but um, before 1800 Belmont, there was a place called Wonderful Things. Yes. Yeah, God rest his soul, Bernard Gray yes. became one of the ancestors. But I wonder if there will ever be another Wonderful Things, because I bought some wonderful little dolls there. Mm -hmm. And um, it would be great to see a place where all the artists could, you know, put their dolls and, um, and we come by them. Probably not, because everything runs, of course. We 
we, wonderful things, Sun Gallery, Belmont Arts, everything was created because we didn't have images of ourselves out there. So we had to create what, what you see now in the last 30 years. Now people can go on the internet and people are copying. We did, we work from inside the pain, the lack of, so it's, it will probably be a circle where they can't, they, the younger kids, people will have to dig to find like we had to dig and find, so. We can pass, it, pass things on, but they're, they're looking at it in a different sense. We needed it to keep going, to survive. Some, some younger people I find look at it as decoration. They don't, they don't go deep, as I say. They don't know the, the, ans the ancestral um, memory. You know, that's an ancestral memory. That's a blood memory that mm -hmm. kept us going, so. Thank you. Yes. Uh -huh. This and Miss Austin, is it Austin? Miss mm -hmm. she? Thank you so very much. But there's faces that I've seen that I never connected with, and I didn't know so many people here that you see their faces. They come to Francine shows in her home. You may you have a connection, but you don't really really know. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for um, expanding my intellectual knowledge about what this world that I'm in, this is my community. And it feels, it's just incredible. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> Bia and I are old, very old friends. We started here probably mm. together. Mm. Wow. <laughs> I think we were almost 20, 40 something. Mm. <laughs> but I wanted to thank her on behalf of the golf community. Thank mm -hmm. you so much for thinking of us. And tomorrow's mm -hmm. Deborah's birthday. So oh, thank you, Deborah. Happy birthday. Thank, 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 thank you for filling in. It's an incredible honor to have all of you here, not only the incredible artists here on the stage, but also the artists in the audience. Thank you so much for coming and for sharing your, your beautiful souls and your art and your wisdom. And I hope that people will continue to converse after the official program is, has ended and to go in and look at the beautiful dolls on display in both rooms. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you.